Welcome to REST, which stands for Resiliency and Empowerment Seminar today. I am your host, Susan Gans, and I'm the founder of Gans Strategic Solutions, where we work at the intersection of business and human behavior. This show is about interviewing leaders of small and mid-sized businesses, as well as nonprofits. We hear about the journeys of these leaders, as well as information about their organizations and how they're being resilient, especially in these challenging times. I'm so delighted today to welcome Ellen Kaplan to our show. A little bit about Ellen. Ellen is a photographer. You might see some beautiful pictures behind her. I happen to have one of her works beside me here. It's gorgeous um, blue moon setting, uh, which I love. And um, it was really at the urging of her husband where she took a formal photography workshop about 20 years ago at the Rocky Mountain School of Photography. And she's worked very hard to, to capture the essence of things. So she's um, worked at ICP, the International Center for Photography, doing basic black and white and color uh, studies. And um, her first teacher had an impact on her um, for conveying the complicated principles of basic photography and for the support that uh, was offered to her along the way. And um, knew when to go uh, close up or to stop and um, really blossom. And uh, she continued to take courses and workshops um, and uh, was introduced to the professional women photographers. And her membership in this organization allowed her to submit work, which was chosen for display in the Rose Month at the exhibition of the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens in June of 20, uh, 2005. And she's always been drawn to the details of objects that then become objects in and of themselves. And it's focusing on this kind of detail uh, through her specific camera lens that uh, she did some work on calla lily leaves and revealed their multi-colored striations and caracus, all the detail. And um, she says, whatever develops in her evolution of a photographer, she offers to the eye of the beholder her vision. And um, she, as she says, if her photographs offer enough pleasure to a viewer, who then choose to buy her work, a majority of the proceeds will be donated to the support of the humane work of local animal charities. So welcome to the show, Ellen. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so tell us about those early days. What drew you to be a photographer? Well, I did not start out that way. Uh, basically, it was when I met my husband, uh, who has been doing photography since he was approximately 10 years old. And um, whenever we went on vacations or we took walks in the park, I would be his caddy, carry his <laughs> camera equipment and hand him the right lens or not. And uh, this went on for about the first few years of our marriage. And then he, he decided uh, to get a degree in, um, in, in college through, through Empire College at SUNY, which is a one-to-one -one mentor type uh, relationship and had the good fortune of, of being, um, having his photos checked by Ken Wittenberg, who was one of the original life photographers. And um, Ken said, I can either give you 12 credits for what you've done, or I can give you six credits and then teach you for six credits. So we had Ken as a teacher for his six credits. And since Donnie is a landscape photographer, uh, Ken said, you only do portraits, no landscape. And it was 10 black and white rolls of film a week. And we 
developed it in our studio apartment with dark curtains and um, the cats would wake up, the dog would go to sleep and I would get very sleepy by the, by the chemicals. So that, that's, that's where it actually started. And um, it was Ken who suggested that I get a camera and uh, go along with Donnie when he was doing his 10 rolls of film. And so that's basically when I started getting um, actual um, input about how to use a camera. And um, so that I, I, I started carrying the camera around with me and um, became the photographer for um, events at my job, which happened to be at the Board of Education Special Ed. And if somebody retired or had some kind of a, a, an occasion, I would bring my camera and take pictures. They let me practice on them in the office, which was very kind. Um, and then we, we gave them the photos as we developed them in black and white. Uh, and eventually, well, Donnie took a, a uh, workshop in, with the Rocky Mountain School of Photography on the Oregon coast. And um, I told him I was certainly not ready to do that. But he met uh, the teacher there. He had a, a very good experience. So he said, why don't you come along the next time? So I said, okay. And we must remember that when I started learning at ICP, it was film, it was not digital. So all the courses that I took in basic were about film uh, photography. And I had all these courses on which film was good for people's skin color, which was good for landscape. And um, I mean, that was, that was a course by itself. And so when we started at Rocky Mountain, it, it was still a film camera. We had graduated to a Nikon by then. And um, this was in Ure, Colorado, 10,000 feet above sea level. Um, I had to be very careful what I ate. I did not drink because it made me too sleepy. Because you get up at 4.30 in the morning wow. to get yourself showered and ready to go out at six on the little Humvees they had to take us all the way up 10,000 feet in the mountains of Ure, Colorado. Um, so that's why they call it a workshop. You do a lot of work and you get to spend a long day doing it. Um, and, you know, I would do my regular thing of trying to find what was interesting to me and focus on it. And um, I thought I was, I was making progress. Uh, and then every now and again, Donnie would come, my husband would come over and say, you can't take the photo that way. You're staring right into the sun. And I would get irritated with him, but of course he was right. And um, I mean, I certainly took a lot, and this was slide film. We use Fuji slide film because that's very saturated. The colors come out very strongly. And, um, you know, we had, we had the slides developed and then we had, we chose some to be critiqued by the teachers. And um, I started getting an idea as to what I wanted to focus on, uh, which was, you know, I, I wasn't the large mountain range kind of person. So if we passed uh, through a small town and they had architecture that I enjoyed, a window with shutters or what have you, I would stop and try and take that. And uh, so it was basically it was experimental. I thought I was doing very well. I had never concentrated so long on uh, taking photographs when, you know, from six in the morning and you came back for lunch and then you had your critiques and then you went out again before uh, dinner because the sun stayed out until 8, 8.30. And that's the best color that you can take 
in the uh, the sunset. So um, we had a, our final day, and and everyone was getting their critiques from from the teachers as where they needed to go forward. One lucky woman uh, who had a very inexpensive camera I was told she needed to go to um, the Rocky Mountain School of uh, Photography Intensive, which is uh, a summer program in, in training to become a professional. So here I was listening to this. Oh, she, she, was, I mean, she did very well. And then it comes to Ellen and they say, Ellen, you need to take some basic photography courses. So uh, needless to say, I was very disappointed, but um, I did follow through and inquired at ICP. And I started at the very basic uh, beginning, basic one and basic two with Kay Kenny. And she was very supportive, a lot of fun as a teacher. And um, she did, she encouraged, she didn't critique when, when we showed our slides because all of this was still being done on slides. Um, she, she would give her observations in terms of the laws of photography. Like one of the laws of photography is the rule of three. Uh, when you take a photo, and I think this carries over into painting as well, because I've noticed it since the photography, I've noticed it in museums with paintings. The, um, you, you have three separate sections, like if you're taking a sunset, you have the beach, the water, and the sun, or you have the water, the sun, and the sky. So your, your photo is divided into three sections. And whenever uh, you possibly can, they like the number three. If you take a close-up of a flower and there are only two, they said, well, it's all right, but you really needed another flower in there. So, and, and of course we had the house in Vermont, so there were a lot of flowers in the garden. So that was one of the things I practiced on. And that's where I came up with the calla lily. And uh, I, I was, you know, I never paid much attention. I mean, flowers are pretty, but I never paid attention to the combination of the leaves. This is before the, it even flowered. So, um, and I had been, uh, constant assignments from ICP. So I was photographing every day, doing my assignments every, every week. And of course um, I started, this may interest people, my first course in photography was right after 9-11. So that a lot of the photography was uh, black and white and it was memorials and it was uh, the light in the sky from, um, you know, that was the first reminder of the first year of, um, of the anniversary. So, um, and, I started developing my own style and um, I preferred close-ups, what they call macro photography. And um, we went on numerous workshops and I found that the second workshop I went to, which was after taking Kay's courses at ICP, that my photographs started getting better and the critiques were getting better. And someone who had been in a class with me before at Ure was very surprised at how much progress I had made. I noticed this about her. I don't know um, if she was actually aware of, of the fact that she was relating to me that way, but that's how I interpreted it. And so I, I started to notice that I made, I, I, was, I was definitely into the rules of photography Unfortunately, I'm not a math physics major, and most of the rules of photography are physics. So um, it's, it's rather important to become grounded in, in the rules, which is why I mentioned in my bio, the, the close up, close down and open up. No, 
I still get them confused. But there was an engineer in the class who said, those are not possibly concepts of physics. It does not work like that. So, um, because you're talking about bringing the camera down to a larger aperture. When you go down, it's larger. When you go up, it's smaller. So when you close up, you're getting a smaller aperture. When you close down, you're getting a bigger aperture. And he just said, it doesn't work. Science doesn't work like that. But, um, and then the, the, we continued going on workshops and the, ph the photograph that you showed by Blue Moon, yeah. that was the first uh, photo that looked somewhat professional. Uh, it was in Nova Scotia. We were in Blue Rocks, Nova Scotia, which is a fishing village. And I had been, you know, we had been taking photos uh, in the morning. We had broken for lunch. We came back to Blue Rocks at um, sunset. And I was, I was getting very frustrated. So uh, my husband didn't want to go back to the car yet. He wasn't ready. He, he, he was still taking sunset shots. So I just walked around with my camera and I looked up and there was the moon. And I said, oh, let me try this. And I, that was the first time I got the actual rules where you see the water with the boat on it and you see the sky and way up there is the moon. And um, it was, a, the, the teacher was pleasantly surprised. He said, Ellen, that's really very nice. <laughs> Awesome. So, and this happened to be the teacher who ran the school of Rocky Mountain School of Photography. So I was very pleased. And um, basically, um, most of the photography was, was done with in classes and at workshops. That's the way I learned best. Um, I'm, I'm not someone, well, I, in, in many situations, I have definitely uh, learned by trying and being in the, in the middle of the experience, but photography, I really needed some kind of, of frame framework. And, um, and I had, and, and that's what, what ICP gave me. They had, I had a lighting class where, you know, used different kinds of light. I used um, sunlight, I used, um, you know, electric light, which by the way, in film, changes the color of your film. It has an orange cast to it. So you had to learn all these things, as they say, these laws of physics, that when a, a, a film meets an electric bulb, there's an orange cast to it. And um, that's why I, I frequently went back to black and white, because you didn't have to worry about the, the, the colors. When you know, we took a black and white picture, it was a, a lamppost and it wasn't orange. So, um, so I, I remember this teacher because she was a, a very difficult teacher. I, I said something about um, when I was on a workshop that I had to have my husband help me with the um, setting up the camera a certain way. I don't know whether it was the film or the aperture or whatever. And she said, you should not let your hubby touch your camera. <laughs> So uh, I remembered her class and it was lighting, which is a very difficult subject. And so, um, and I remember that I, I have a statue of Tara, who is the, the goddess of um, love and family in, in um, the Buddhist religion. And um, I put a candle in front of it I set it on the table, put a candle in front of it. And when you put a candle under someone's chin or under the statue, the way I did on the book below it, it becomes very mysterious. You have a shadow up to the head and, and you get this, this kind of halo effect. So all of those classes um, sank in one way or another and gave me a lot of room to uh, experiment. And uh, then, of course, I tried the route of becoming a professional. And that's the most difficult because 
number one, there are millions of other photographers out there trying to do the same thing. And um, one has to have contacts. One needs to get one's work shown in galleries. And this is what, what Kay sent me to PWP. And that gave me a little bit more confidence that maybe I could actually become professional. And so I, I spoke to some marketing people and um, I, I spoke to people who, who uh, had connections with galleries. And finally, of course, um, that's one of the things that we will discuss later, but I didn't have the perseverance. And um, because one has to have confidence and uh, in one's work and a pretty assertive personality to make one's way in the competitive life of the artist. Um, I mean, I did have, I, I had some background in other creative areas. Uh, I, I mean, I, I had to work for a living, so I became, uh, I got a degree in early childhood education and moved into special ed. And I had some very good mentors from, from that area who, who made me more um, confident that I could handle situations. But um, to, to actually sell yourself was something that I never quite managed. So um, that's why I put on my last line, I, I happen to be an animal activist and have supported as many organizations as we can afford to support. And um, if, if anyone had been interested in buying them, um, I would have, have donated most of it to charity because it was not something I needed to make a living at, but it was something that I, I love to do. So, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a combination of the way, what, what your interest is, um, how you learn, so you go forward choosing the path of how you need to learn, and then of finding your own style and your own creative vision. And um, that's the process that I went through from Ure, Colorado, <laughs> Through ice it's, it's been a, quite a journey, and um, I'm struck by all the different mentors that you've had, and in your career, you know, from from Danny to Ken to Kay, and all, and in your early childhood education. So, can you just share with us? Um, uh, some of the things that you just learned from the mentors. I mean, you talked about, you know, yourself taking away, embracing your interests, how you learn and, and coming into your own style. But can you just expand upon sort of the role of mentors and people who have advocated for you as well in your, your career? Well, I started out as a classroom teacher in early childhood, which is a, a daycare center. And, um, I had no idea how to control a class. It was, a, you know, we, I had an assistant teacher, but there they were four-year-olds and there were, I think, at least 20 of them. And, um, you know, you sit in class at your, you know, at, at the College of Education and you take notes. And then when you get into a class, what do you do? So you learn by doing. I didn't learn very well in a class. I was supposed to have a supervisor come help me. And she heard me raising my voice to the children, like time to get ready for lunch. <laughs> and um, she said, oh, I can't work with somebody like that. So I, I told the, the, the administration at the daycare center, what kind of a supervisor is that? She sees I'm having difficulty she's the one who should have come in and given me support and some ideas. So half of the beginning of my experience in the classroom 
was not well supervised, it was not well supported. And I moved into classrooms of functionally retarded and, and disabled children. Uh, some were Down syndrome, some were neurologically impaired, some were schizophrenic. Um, and of course, they're even more difficult to deal with. It was a smaller class, thank goodness, of probably about 10 of them. And I never, I, I never stayed at a job more than a year, either because they requested that I leave or I decided it was not for me. So I finally um, heard, a, uh, just when, when I was working th at the last uh, school for um, disabled kids, mainly emotionally handicapped, um, one of the members of the Board of Ed came and gave a discussion about this new pilot program that they were starting. And um, it was called Evaluation and Placement, and it was the, the, the team approach. And this is when the federal government was starting to recognize that they needed a law for um, education for all children, not just the ones who could sit in a classroom and listen. And um, so I went, to the Board of Ed, and um, it was this, this was very surprising. But someone my mother had worked with many years before, her husband had been a fire chief, and when he retired, he was still young. So he got into the Board of Ed, and he was the one who interviewed me to get into the Board of Ed. And knowing my whole background since I was like seven years old, um, he he felt you know he he gave me the proper credentials to get into the board of ed let's say um and yes and and that's uh that's someone that i i don't think of that often but he was definitely a mover for me and um and because of that when i had the interview with the uh head of the pilot program she understood from what I said that I'd had experience with a lot of different types of issues with that the children have from your your daycare center where they came off the boat from China and didn't speak a word of English to um, children who were three years old and were still not toilet trained and uh, you know you ha you had to work with that in the classroom along with your other just, just you know very disturbed children so she gave me my first chance by feeling that i had a background of observation and that i had i had you know dealt with all these um different types of kids so that if i became an educational evaluator i would have something to work on and so that was that was my job um she she was the um basically the first mentor and I came to become her assistant for a while and she her her method was uh, give an assignment that you need to do this administratively and then let you carry it out yourself but, you know she didn't she didn't give any uh, structural help or anything like that work it out yourself and um, I had a different kind of uh, mentor whom I call a model because she micromanaged me also and when when we had become the committees on the handicapped she was the chairperson of the district and she she looked over my shoulder I had to write down notes every time I had a con con uh, phone conference with anybody parent or a district supervisor or whoever and so between the two of them I had the model and I had the um, the mentoring to move me in you know in in a positive direction. Yeah. And um, and that that was carried further when I when I went into supervision administration and the uh, teacher I had not only helped me get a degree in supervision administration she she's the one who was my enabler when i decided i want to write books so um it's been a long journey in terms of different kinds of 
creative outlets. And um, I, she, I, did, I did write with, with her support. As I say, she was an enabler. I mean, a mentor in supervision administration, but an enabler. How do you start a book? And somehow or another, she was able to pull together the pieces and set me on the path. And um, she's definitely one of the most memorable people in my life. So, um, and, and that's, you know, so, so first I had the writing, the uh, Board of Education turned out to be very politically inflexible. They fired my boss. I was, uh, had a reverse halo effect because I had been her assistant. So I was pushed into a corner given the worst possible job for me, which is um, using a computer number one, which is back in the early 80s where they were just developing computers. And number two, uh, testing kids coming back from residential treatment centers, how well they did in math. I flunked remedial math in college. So that was not exactly my best subject. Um, and so that's, that's when I took a leave from the board and, and uh, with, with my uh, mentor's help at, at um, in supervision administration started working on how to deal with actually writing a book. And it incorporated using handicapped characters. So, um, you know, that, that was another step in, in learning how, what, what areas needed to be developed in the um, sphere of human compassion. Let's put it that way. Yes, you know, I want to interject here that um, your mentors really helped propel you because you could have stopped at any point and, and given up. What I get from your story is that you pivoted and embraced different creative outlets for yourself. And so I, I want to talk about uh, resilience um, and how you've become resilient you've had so many different inflection points along your uh, along the way in your journey so how have you kept going what what motivates you and how have you been resilient uh, well basically it's it stemmed from my interests in in high school i had a very good um teacher the last year, it was the, uh, the advanced placement class, so we were considered the, the honor students. And he taught me how to write. And uh, we had the advanced placement test. And I, I got the top, it was a, a one to a five, I got a five. So that showed me, um, you know, wasn't, it wasn't a personal judgment, it was the judgment of this test that I am a good writer. So um, I frequently strayed from teaching and I went to NYU for a year taking American and English literature and uh, then had to make a living. So I had to go back to teaching. Um, you know, when you're in college, you're in your last years. Oh my God, I'm going to graduate. What am I going to make a living at? So um, basically, there's always been that creative need and it worked with the the books i had the same issue with the, with the writing trying to uh, market myself and at that time it was much more difficult you couldn't self-publish on amazon which you can do now uh self-publishing was was called um something rather unflattering uh vanity press i believe is what they called it and you had to pay for it so I had an agent at one time, she, her, her version of what she could get from my book was such that she didn't push it very hard. So again, the marketing came in and, uh, and that's when I moved into 
the sphere of my husband's business and became his back office. And again, learning by doing. So that, that's, that's basically how I've gotten through life. Learning by doing and, and carrying on, pressing on. Um, before we close out today's session, what would you like people to remember about our conversation today? As I've mentioned, uh, I went quite far in the areas that I worked in, both in um, working with the special education, writing two novels with help from my enabler, doing photography with, with uh, both my husband and other uh, mentors. And I always got stopped at, by my lack of confidence and um, inability to assert myself and, and sell myself, market myself. So my main message would be, if it's something you really want to do, just keep at it. That's a great message. Just keep at it. Just keep going, keep believing in yourself and the magic will happen. So Ellen, how can we find you in your beautiful photographs? I do have a website that is uh, Ellen Kaplan, all small letters, dot com. And if you're lucky, it'll come up with that blue moon picture that I took in Blue Rocks, Nova Scotia. Um, and I'm sure most of the people listening are much more uh, competent on the computer than I was because it was late in life that that one came along. So, um, and, and we, we have, um, I mean, if you're really interested, my, my, um, my email is ellen.kaplan at smcdata.com. We have copies of our photos. We use them uh, in my husband's business to be remembered by important people and clients. And so if, if anyone is interested, uh, we do have certain of the photos around that we can um, sell for a small donation <laughs> to an animal. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'm going to repeat that. So Ellen's website is ellencaplan.com and Kaplan is spelled K-A-P-L-A-N. You could also find her via email at ellen.kaplan at smcdata. C data. Thank you. So Ellen, it's been so wonderful to speak with you today. Thank you so much. And to our audience, we hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Keep going at what you're doing, believe in yourself, and we look forward to the next conversation. Bye for now.